Good morning, Grace. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord, we come before you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for waking us up this morning, for gathering your saints and your sinners, Lord, under your throne of grace. We thank you that you have given us the opportunity once more to um, fellowship together here in this um, hallowed space that you have granted for us, Lord. We do not take it for granted. We thank you, Lord, and give you praise and thanksgiving for Grace Brethren Church family. We are delighted for any guests um, who are here with us today or online, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will uh, receive our prayers and that there will be no hindrances of our praise, of our intercessionary prayers. For the desire of our heart, Lord, is to please you and to follow you. Heavenly Father, we want to, in recognition that it's been really two years uh, about that, Lord, since we've uh, been in this throes of the pandemic, Lord, we thank you for the many faithful members of Grace Brethren Church and for the many faithful servants who have ministered to us here at Grace, Lord. We thank you for our pastors and for their leadership. We thank you, Lord, that you have granted us a school that has been able to continue to do the ministry, the great work that you have called us to in educating young lives. We thank you, Lord, for keeping them protected, the students and staff, and for the activities that have been able to take place. And Lord, here at Grace Brethren, we seek to be a light on that hill to families and to students and to our community. And so we thank you for those who have found uh, the knowledge of the truth in you, Lord, here in, in this community of believers. As we remember the work of our ministries, Lord, we also want to give special thanks for our ushers who have stood and welcomed us and served us through all of these uh, many months, Lord, during the pandemic. We often ask, Lord, about, well, what are the answers to our prayers where we are seeing your answers right here this morning and many of the mornings past on Sunday and on other days when we've been able to congregate. So we lift up our ushers, we lift up our music ministry, praise God for their uh, faithfulness, Lord. We lift up our technical team, we lift up the, um, those who have served in our children's um, and in our Sunday school program. And Lord, we just continue to call out to you, giving thanksgiving for your mercy and your grace in our community of believers here, Lord. And we continue to ask for you to uh, remove this pandemic from our midst, Lord. But more importantly, Lord, we continue to ask you to call on and to draw near your people to yourself. Lord, and our, uh, each, each Sunday when we come together, we bring our burdens before your throne of grace. We certainly know that none of us are perfect. All of us are sinners, Lord. We also know that we need, your, we need you. We need you in meeting our, the desires of our hearts for the healing, for bringing closer to you, Lord, those who have drifted away. We need you, Lord, to bring light in the dark places in our own hearts and in our own families and our communities. We pray for your continued provisions over um, our, the needs for us as people, Lord, and we ask for your healing and the health needs, Lord, and our traumas, and that you, we would just delight in knowing that with each of these challenges and these difficulties that we can uh, lean on you, Lord, and that we can remember not to be boastful of our own capabilities and our success, but be thankful for our capabilities and our success, Lord, but also to be remembering that you desire for us, Lord, to lean on you, to know and delight in you. Heavenly Father, we continue also uh, to lift up the prayers of the departed and our dear sister Sharon Vetters, a prior member, a long-term member here at Grace and a member of the school staff. We pray for her life, Lord, and we thank you for her life. We pray comfort and peace on her family at this time of loss. Lord, with intercessionary prayers, we lift up the people who are 
in the throes of war. We pray, Lord, for the people of Ukraine, for that nation, Lord. We pray for our Christian church in Ukraine. We pray that you will be glorified and that there would our missionaries and those who are serving uh, to meet the needs of for healing and protection, Lord, we just ask your mighty blessing upon them. And Lord, we remember, as you have instructed us in 1 Timothy 2, 4, when we are called on to pray for our kings and our leaders, Lord, that you, the Heavenly Father, the Creator of all, desire all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Lord, as our pastor Jack Hunt comes to share the word with you, we pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds may be open, that you may bless him and anoint him in this time of sharing your word to your people, Lord. And we pray that we will grow as devoted disciples, touching the lives of others. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. I want to make one more plug here if I can. I'm going to move this table up just a little bit. Um, for the missions event that's coming up, uh, the Secret Church, I want to really encourage you guys to join with us on that. It's going to be a really neat night. I know the schedule's a little bit strange, 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. That's past my bedtime too. But the reason we're doing it like that is it's strategically designed so that we can connect with our brothers and sisters around the world. And so actually, brothers and sisters will be joining this live stream with us from all over the world some of them in places where persecution is very real. And so part of our night is going to be praying for them. But the theme of the night is going to be identity, which I think we can all agree this is something we really need to be rooted in. Our world's very confused about identity. So on this night, we're going to be dealing with some of those tough issues, uh, the issues of transgenderism, the issues of uh, how artificial intelligence plays into our world, even the metaverse. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the metaverse. I had to look it up. But we're going to be dealing with some of these things, and really, I think it's going to be a great night where, we can, where we're going to be investing in teaching, and we're going to be investing a lot of time in prayer. I want to also make clear that this isn't a, uh, a fellowship event. This is a missions prayer uh, event. And so we're going to be real, it's going to be an intense time, but I think it'll be a very worthwhile time if you're able to join us. Okay? Again, April 29th, 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. All right, take your Bibles if you would. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Matthew this morning. And I'm going to be honest with you. Well, let me get, before I get there, let me say this. Have you, um, have you ever had something you were really looking forward to? A day you were really looking forward to? Remember when you were a kid and Christmas was coming? And you were counting down the days? I remember in my school we had a countdown board, which as I look back probably wasn't the best one. Because every day I just saw the countdown, oh, we're closer, we're closer. Um, and so we counted down and we looked forward. And probably you guys, some of you, you start that now. I, I know some people start their countdown to Christmas in July. I think Walmart does that based on what they have out on their shelves. All right. Um, so you look for, forward to Christmas. When I was a kid, actually, the only day we looked forward to more than Christmas was the last day of school. I never actually tried to accelerate the coming of Christmas, but man, did I try to accelerate the coming. There were some times where I thought, how bad would it be to end the, end the year on school just to get out a couple of days? Um, you know, I found as I've been working in the school for the last 15 years, you know, the only people who look forward to the last day of school more than students? Teachers. Yeah. You, you, it's, it's so funny to see the smile on their faces the day the kids go. <laughs> and they're still there doing paperwork. Still there getting ready for the summer. But they look forward to it as well. But can you imagine if you look forward to a day for years and then missed it? Could you imagine if you looked forward to Christmas for the entire season and then, I don't know, took some sleeping pills and slept through it? Could you imagine how, how disappointing that would be? Now imagine if you would, if you looked forward to something for hundreds of years and you missed it. That's the passage we're going to be looking at today. As was mentioned earlier today, today's Palm Sunday. 
And so today we're going to look at the passage where we talk about the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. And I'll be honest with you, for years and years, this was a confusing passage for me. I don't know if you were like me and you grew up on the, on the Easter plays. Every year our church would have a passion play. We'd go, and I always loved the scene of the triumphal entry because that's one of the big churches we go to. That's, they actually brought horses down the aisle. And that was just awesome. I'm like, this is amazing. But it was always confusing to me because it seemed to me like that should be the culmination. That should be the peak of everything. That should be where all the excitement was. And it always puzzled me, how was Jesus able to enter the city so triumphantly? And then a week later, they fight him. And the, and the story of the triumphal entry was lost on me for years and years. But today as we walk through it, I want you to see something. This is actually the most important gate in the history of the Jewish nation. They've been looking forward to this day for ages. And they missed it. So let's look at the passage. We're in, we're in the book of Matthew. Matthew 21. I'm going to read the whole passage. So you guys bear with me. Stick with me as we go through it here. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you. And immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. And he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did, did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, You hear what, the, what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. I want you to capture everything that's going on here. Jesus is coming to the end of his ministry. He knows he's coming to the end of his ministry. He gives his disciples this really unusual instruction. Basically, go commit grand theft donkey. Um, he says, go into the city, and, and there's going to be a donkey tied there, and I want you to go get the donkey, and when you walk away with it, if anybody stops you, say, the Lord needs the donkey. Let me ask you a question. If that's your donkey, is that a good enough explanation for you? I'm kind of thinking, hey, where, where's my donkey going? Who says the Lord needs it? What I think actually happened here, guys, is actually this. Some people take the idea that Jesus prepared ahead of time, and he arranged with the owner. I don't think that's what happened. What I think happened is that God arranged all this. And I think he worked in the hearts of the donkey owner long before the disciples got there to let them know somebody's coming to take your donkey, and it's okay. And you're going to know it's okay because they're going to tell you, I need your donkey. Uh, we see something similar to this in the book of Acts when Jesus prepares, uh, the Holy Spirit prepares the heart of Cornelius and Peter before he brings them into contact with each other. But I think that that's what's happening here. He sends his disciples in to go get this donkey and bring it to him. He says, I'm going to ride this donkey into the city. And I want you to see what happens when he comes into the city. Crowds of people are there, and they're laying their cloaks on the ground, and they're laying palm trees on the ground, and they're yelling, Hosanna. And there's this triumphal entry, 
And then the people are saying, who is this? They said, this is the prophet, Jesus, of Galilee. It's an amazing culmination of all of Jesus' ministry. And actually, we're going to see here in a minute, a lot of things he does here breaks character from what he's been doing for the rest of his ministry. But here's the question. What's the point? See, God doesn't just record stuff in Scripture just because it's an interesting story. He records it for us to understand something that's very important. And I'm going to give away the end here. I'm going to tell you what, G what is happening here on this day. This is Jesus coming to be presented to the nation of Israel as their king. When he comes into the city, the announcement that's being made is, the king is here. And not just any king. The Messiah has arrived. And here's the thing, we can't, we can't fully wrap our heads around. The Messiah is the only thing they've been looking forward to for thousands of years. Since the Babylonian captivity, the Jewish nation has never been free. And they've been looking forward to the Messiah who's going to come, and they think, make them free. They've been looking forward to this forever, and now here comes the day, and their king has arrived. And you, you might be asking, Jack, how do you know that's what the message is, passage is? It's in the passage. I want you to look here at what happens. He comes in, and they say that they went and they got the colt. They got the donkey and the donkey's colt. It says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Here's what's going on. All right, Jesus is arriving, and what we see first is we see the arrival of the king. And Jesus is announcing his kingship over the nation of Israel by the way that he arrives in the city. First thing I want you to see, the king arrived just the way the king was supposed to arrive. In Zechariah 9.9, 9, this prophecy is being mentioned here. Zechariah had told them the Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he's going to come riding on a donkey. Kind of a weird thing to ride into a city, right? Usually, usually these days when the king comes into town, he rides a limousine. In the ancient world, he'd come in riding on a horse. But actually, the, they'd been prophesying the Messiah coming riding on a donkey. There's a reason for that. When the Messiah comes riding on a donkey, he's proclaiming peace. In the ancient world, especially in the nation of Israel, when a king was going to war, he rode a horse. When a king was in peace, he rode a donkey. And so when the king is riding into the city, he's proclaiming, I'm the king and I'm coming to bring you peace. But I want you to see, he arrived exactly the way he was supposed to arrive. He arrived riding on the colt of a donkey. He arrived just the way the prophets had predicted he'd arrive. And anybody who was, who was observant, an observant Jew should have looked at this and said, that looks familiar. This seems to be something I should be waiting for. And it's interesting, for a little bit they seemed to get it. But you know, beyond the fact that he arrived the way he was supposed to arrive, what I find fascinating is he arrived exactly when he was supposed to. If you have your Bibles, keep your finger here in Matthew. Turn over to the book of Daniel. I'm going to share with you a passage that I find amazing. I find, I'll be honest with you, at one point in my life, when I was questioning some of my beliefs and questioning my faith, I went to this passage and said, you know what, there has to be a God because this passage is so accurate. It's a prophecy. You guys have heard of the prophecy, I'm sure, at some point. The prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks. And Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks is incredibly specific. And I want to read to you uh, just a couple verses of it. And I'll commend it to you for you to read on your own at some point. But Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. The angel's telling Daniel, says, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, uh, of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the people of the prince who is, who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end, there shall be war, desolations are decreed. All right, here's what I want you to see here. What the angel tells Daniel is, listen, there's going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks, okay? 
Math's not my strongest suit, but when you add up 2 and 7, it comes to 69, right? All right. So what, what Daniel's saying here is he's saying there's going to be this group of years. These weeks here are actually groups of seven years. And so what he's saying is there's going to be a period of 483 years from the time that a decree is issued to the time that the Messiah is going to come. He says the time when the anointed one is going to come and is going to be cut off. And so what, what Daniel actually gives, he gives a very specific, detailed prophecy for when the Messiah is going to come. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I did not do this work myself. If you want to see this work worked out, Josh McDowell has in his book, New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. There are several other places that have this spelled out. But they have actually dated, they have a date for the decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild and restore the city of Jerusalem. And it's the first day of Nisan, 444 B.C. And when they start adding from that date, using the 360-day ca- calendar of the Jewish nation, and they add up all the days, and they, and they measure them all out, and they count up all the days, they run those days forward from that date, and you know what date it comes to? It comes to the day of Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered the city. See, what I find amazing is when God makes a prophecy, he doesn't mess around. He makes it specific. He makes it clear. When he wants us to get something, he, he puts it out there for us to get, right? And he says to the Jewish nation, from the day this decree goes out to the day the anointed one comes, there's going to be this many days. And I'm always amazed. And, of course, we have to be honest, 2020, being hindsight, 2020 hindsight is a lot easier than living through it, right? But I'm always amazed at these men who memorize and memorize the Old Testament, didn't see this fact coming. It's always been a puzzlement to me that why, why there wasn't a welcoming party for the Messiah waiting outside Jerusalem on this day, because God had predicted it to this very day. So not only did the Messiah arrive the way he was supposed to arrive, he arrived exactly the minute he was supposed to arrive. It's amazing. See, Jesus is proclaiming his kingship because he says, look, I'm arriving like the king. I'm coming when the king's supposed to come. Jerusalem, city, uh, nation of Israel, I am your king. And you know what? Like I said before, it seems for a second like the people get it. Because how do they respond? When he came into the city, they greeted him just like a king. It says that they, they took their cloaks and they laid them on the donkey. Some of the people took their cloaks and they laid it on the ground, and they allowed Jesus to, crawl, to walk across the city on his donkey, walking over their cloaks, and they greeted him as a king. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, we actually have this exact thing playing out with a king named Jehu. Jehu was not a good king, but when he was proclaimed as king, you know what the people did? They threw their cloaks on the ground so that he could walk over. And so when the people see the Messiah coming, they for a moment realize that this must be the king, and so they go out and they greet him with their cloaks on the ground, They grab palm leaves and they throw them on the ground so that he can walk across the city without his donkey even touching the earth. And so they greet him like a king. Not only do they they cheer him like a king, they prepare a path for him like a king. And not only that, I want you to notice something here. They call him by the name of the king. Here in this passage in chapter 21, verse, verse 15, it says, when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. The son of David is not, is, not, is not just a genetic term. It's not just saying, hey, here's Jesus who's descended from David. By the way, we look in both Matthew and Luke, and we see that he's directly descended from David. As a matter of fact, if you look at Matthew and Luke, the two genealogies, No one in the world had a stronger claim to the throne of Israel than Jesus. If there had still been a throne of Israel that had passed down through proper succession, Jesus would have been sitting on that throne. That was his lineage. And so they called, but the name Son of David was always used for one person. It was always used for the Messiah. When the Jews spoke of the Son of David, they were always saying the Messiah. And so when they see Jesus coming, they say, Hosanna to who? the son of David. Not only do they greet him like a king, not only do they make a path for him like the king, they call him by the name of the king. And what's interesting is Jesus doesn't stop him, does he? 
There's one other thing here. You know, sometimes we have these words into the scripture that we don't always fully understand. But really show us, tell us a lot. One of the things he does here, they greeted him like a king by, again, making a path for him like a king. They greeted him like a king by calling him the name of the king. But the other thing they do here that's really interesting, they say to him, Hosanna. Son of David. That word Hosanna is an interesting word. It's not just a praise word. You know what it actually means? It means deliver us. Actually, more, more emphatically, it means deliver us now. So what they're actually doing, they're calling to, to Jesus to deliver. They're asking him to take the action of a king. They're saying, you're the son of David, deliver us now. Now, of course, what they're thinking about is all these dirty Romans that are running around, we want you to get rid of them. But they're calling out to him as their king, as their Messiah, to deliver them. But you know what's the most telling here in all this? Is not how the people respond to Jesus when his kingship's being proclaimed. It's not even the perfect timing that's happening. You know what's most telling? Is the response. You know what's interesting? For his three years of ministry up to this point, whenever people proclaim who he is in public, what does Jesus always do? When the demoniac wants to proclaim that he's the son of David, he says, be quiet. When people want to tell about the miracles, he says, be quiet. He keeps telling them to keep it quiet, and it's always been puzzling me why he kept it quiet. The reason was because it wasn't time yet. But on this day, when they come in and they're calling him the son of David, does he say anything to stop them? No. When they're worshiping to him and they're saying, Hosanna, deliver us, does he say, no, not me? Instead, what he does is he receives their praise. He allows them to call him the king. If they were calling him the wrong thing, don't you think Jesus would have corrected him? So the behavior of Jesus is telling us that he's the king. And you know what? There's even something else that's happening here. Not only does he receive their worship, not only does he receive the title of the son of David, when the chief, when the chief priests and the Pharisees try to rebuke the people, think about this. The religious leaders hear the people calling Jesus the son of David. And to them, that's just blasphemy. They're already in a struggle with, David, with Jesus. They don't accept who he really is. They say to him, don't you hear what these people are saying? And the emphasis is, why don't you stop them? And what's Jesus' response? Haven't you ever read that out of the mouth of baby, suckling infants, God will bring forth praise? What he says to the chief priests and the, and the religious leaders, they got it right. You're wrong. When they call me the son of David, they've got it correct. I am the king. Not only does he receive their worship, but I want you to see what else he does. He goes right from the triumphal entry to where? He goes storming into the temple. When he goes storming into the temple, he finds all the money changers, all the people who have been defrauding the people, all the people who have been, been making the house of God into a den of robbers, is what he calls it. And what's he do? He starts tossing tables. People have a real problem with this Jesus, don't they? When you talk to the world today, they always want to talk about Jesus, meek and mild. They forget about the fact that Jesus tossed tables. I saw a meme one time, and I love this meme. It said, uh, remember, when you ask me what would Jesus do, tipping over tables is not out of the equation. But Jesus goes in, and this is so cool because this is a claim of his kingship. This is a claim of who he is as the Messiah because he goes into God's house, and he starts cleaning things up. Who has the authority to clean God's house? Only God. When Jesus walks into the temple, and by the way, when you see this passage here, he doesn't say, it's written, my father's house is to be a house of prayer. He says, it's written, my house is to be a house of prayer. The son has showed up, the king has showed up, and he's cleaning God's house. And he's saying to the whole world all around him, everybody who's watching, look at me, I'm your king. Here's the thing. <coughs> All the evidence is there. They missed it. It's always puzzled me, and it will probably always puzzle me, <coughs> except for the sovereignty of God. How can we go from Hosanna on Sunday to crucify him on Friday? On Sunday, they seem to know who he is. By the end of the week, they forget it. You know why? I'm going to give you a couple things I think. In spite of everything that's going on, 
They missed the king because they were looking for the wrong king. Think about this. Who were they looking for? They were looking for a political ruler who would come and get rid of the Romans. And as a result, when the Son of God shows up, they miss him because they're looking for the wrong king. Not only that, not only are they looking for the wrong king, they're looking for the wrong deliverance. <coughs> Everything they're trying to do, all they want to see is they want to see a nation of Israel raised up. They want to see them ruling themselves, and they want to see the Romans gone. They just want a political, temporal deliverance. God's got a bigger plan for them. He says, the deliverance I'm bringing isn't just about your nation. It isn't just about right now. It isn't just about political power. It's about my kingdom and eternity. Think about this. They want a kingdom based on the lineage of David, and he's saying, I'm offering you heaven. You want a kingdom for Israel, and I want to set up the kingdom of heaven. You want to be delivered from the Romans. I want to deliver you from your sin. But they miss him because they're looking for the wrong king. They're looking for the wrong deliverance. Not only are they looking for the wrong king and the wrong deliverance, they are looking, um, I apologize, my notes. We can jump to the next slide here. They were looking for the wrong kingdom. See, again, as I said before, they're looking for the kingdom of Israel, and Jesus says, I'm not about the kingdom of Israel. Now, he, now bear in mind here, Jesus is going to fulfill all the promises to the kingdom of Israel. In the last days, there will be a kingdom of Israel, and Jesus will sit on his throne. He will fulfill all those promises. And don't ever think that just because they reject their king on this day that God's not going to fulfill his promises. God will always fulfill his promises. But on this day, he says, it's not about the kingdom of Israel. It's about the kingdom of heaven. And they were, they were so caught up in their kingdom that they missed the bigger kingdom. The other thing I think that was going on is they weren't looking for the king so much as they were looking for what the king could do for them. Remember, remember Jesus' disciples? Their mother goes to him and says, hey, um, Jesus, we know your kingdom's coming. Uh, when you come, can you let my son sit on one, one son sit on the right hand, one sit on the left hand? So even his disciples were looking for what the king could do for them. And the nation of Israel is looking for what the king will do for them. And they're, they're more interested in the gifts and the blessings of the king than they are actually meeting the king. And let me ask you this question. We look at these things that the Jewish nation missed, that caused them to miss their king. Have we ever been guilty of looking at the wrong thing too? You ever been guilty of looking for the wrong king? And you want a Jesus made in your own image, not the Jesus of the scripture show? Maybe you're not so interested in God's kingdom as you're interested in the kingdom of Jack. I'll, I'll be honest with you, man. My kingdom looks really good sometimes. When I'm looking for the wrong kingdom, I miss the king. You ever been so caught up in the blessings of God you get to seek God? I think one of the things we need to remember always when we look at people in Scripture is we get to see under the harsh spotlight with 2020 hindsight the mistakes they made. But one of the reasons God shows us those mistakes is to reveal those same mistakes in our hearts. Same mistakes that the Jewish people make, we can often make with our Savior. And there's a couple sad facts that grow out of this. Because they miss the king, they miss the king because their, miss, their understanding of the king was too small. It's interesting, all the things they were looking for were small potatoes compared to what Jesus wanted to give them. It's, it's funny, we often are afraid of expecting too great a thing from God, but often God wants to give us something even greater than what we're looking for. For the nation of Israel, he wanted to give them something even better than what they wanted. But they were so caught up on their small goals and their small thinking that they missed God's plan. Here's the sad facts. If you seek the wrong king, you're going to miss the real king. Because they were so caught up in looking for their, for their ruling Messiah, they missed the God of the universe in flesh sitting right in front of them on a donkey. If we're looking for the wrong king, we're going to miss the real king too. If we want a king that's going to give us political power, if we want a king that's going to give us prestige, or if we want a king that's going to give us clout, understand we're going to miss the real king. And every time we try to misshape and change who Jesus is to fit what we want, we run the risk of missing the real king. The other thing is this, 
When you miss the real king, the result is always the same, judgment. The nation of Israel, they have this passage from Daniel that tells them that there's going to be this time and then the Messiah is going to come. And this says the Messiah is going to be cut off. That's when the Messiah is turned over to be crucified. But then the next, the next sentence says, and then after that, the ruler that's to come with his people will come and destroy them. The nation of Israel missed their king, and as a result, they fell under the judgment of God. And actually, Jesus predicted this judgment when he was here on earth. When he's walking around, he shows the temple to the disciples, says, listen, there's not going to be a stone here left unturned. What happened is shortly after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, as the disciples are turning the world upside down, sharing the gospel, a war breaks out in Israel, and the Romans come, and they destroy Jerusalem. They destroy the temple, and they exile the people into what's called the diaspora, and it continues until 1948. When we miss the real king, we put ourselves in line for judgment. The nation of Israel was judged because they missed the king. If we mess around with who Jesus is and we don't submit to who the real king is, we also play a game within our judgment. Matter of fact, the most important thing is this. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ and you miss who Jesus Christ is and you don't accept him as your Lord and Savior, you lay yourself in line for eternal judgment. Separated from God in a place called hell. See, Jesus is coming this day to proclaim that he's king so he can also come and be our Savior and die on a cross to pay for our sins. And he calls us to follow him. So what do we need to do here? What do we need to do? All right, so Jesus, the whole, and by the way, let me just make this real clear one more time. When I say this was a day they were looking forward to, I don't want to undersell that at all. You realize the entire history of the Jewish nation was caught up in one of the entire history of the Jewish nation was caught up in the idea there is a Messiah coming for us. Every young Jewish child was told there's a Messiah coming. And you know when, it, when that started? In Genesis 3. You think about this. Going all the way back to the beginning of history, the moment after Adam and Eve sin and they're judged and God is issuing his judgment, in Genesis 3.15, he tells Adam and Eve and he tells the serpent, there's one coming who's going to crush the head of the serpent. And that's the first messianic prophecy. And then from there forward, every generation is receiving these prophecies. Every generation is being told there's a king coming. There's a king coming. There's a Messiah coming. The Son of God is coming. And yet with all that coming, all of human history pointing to this day, they miss it. And it's put there for us to learn a lesson and also for us to see the sovereignty of God. Because let me say this one more thing. It was always God's plan for Jesus to go to the cross. The nation of Israel was given the opportunity to recognize their king, but God always had the plan of sending Jesus to the cross in order to build a greater and bigger kingdom. In order to bring us into his kingdom. In order to conquer death and sin. But we still need to recognize what was happening here. Jesus is proclaiming his kingship. What does that mean for us today? It means that we need to do a couple things. First off, we need to recognize that Jesus is king. He's the rightful king of Israel, but he's also the rightful king of all the world. You know why he's the king? Because he made all of it. He, he, ha he has the authority of creation. But he's also our king because he died for our sins and he called us into relationship with him and he brought us into the kingdom of his father in order for us to live with him. And we need to recognize in our lives every day that he is the king. And what that means is this. We need to let him be king and let us stop being king. We need to let him be king and stop looking for other kings. You know, the church... The, we often are distracted by other people saying, oh, that's the guy who's going to take care of us, or that's the guy who's going to protect us. Remember, we only have one king. We need to recognize who he is, and we need to submit to him. 
Next thing we need is we need to seek him and not just his blessings. See, so often we get caught up with, I'm going to seek God and God's going to bless me. Or I'm going to do this. And we often reduce our relationship with our God and Savior to a transactional interaction. If I do this, he'll do this. And let me be honest with you. God will bless you beyond anything you can ever imagine when you seek him truly. When you seek him just for stuff, it's, you're not going to see the blessing. You ever have somebody who just wants to be your friend because you can give them something? Our God understands that. But what I want you to understand is when you seek God for who he is, and when you seek Jesus for who he really is, all the other stuff will fall in line. But we need to seek him and not just his blessings. And that's so difficult at times. Because we read passages and say, oh, if I do this, he'll do that. Don't worry about what he'll do. Just seek him. And he'll take care of the rest. And the last thing is, if he's really our king, if he really is who he says he is, and we really believe he is who he says he is, you know what we need to do? We need to be all about building his kingdom. That means we need to be all about living in a way that lifts him up and gives him glory and honor, and we need to be all about inviting other people into the kingdom with us. See, Jesus is the king. There can only be one king. If there's only one king, there can only be one kingdom that really matters. And that's the one we've been called to be part of. I want to encourage you as we go through this Easter season to remember who Jesus is and let's seek to build his kingdom. Let's seek to invite other people to come into it. Here's the craziest thing in the world. If we can just get this one thing right, if we can just get the idea that Jesus is the king, his kingdom's what's most important, and we need to be in submission to him, you know what? Almost everything else in our life will just fall into place. I'm not saying it'll be easy. I'm saying they'll fall into place. But we need to recognize who he is, we need to submit to who he is, and we need to make his kingdom the biggest priority in our lives. And when we do that, remember when the disciples did that? They were accused of, here are these men again who are turning the world upside down. When we're about the kingdom, and we're out really building the kingdom, that's when the world gets flipped over. And that's where real change happens. Jesus is our king. Let's serve him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for this passage that shows us so dramatically who Jesus is and what he wants to do in building his kingdom. Lord, we ask you to help us to submit to him, to love him, to serve him, to serve you with all of our hearts for your glory and honor. We ask that you help us to build the kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.